Hello, this is Lee Orff from afar. I'd like to uh, talk to you today about my research on high-resolution thunderstorm modeling. I'll start first with some background, uh, talk about my graduate work, bringing us up to the current day, and then sort of some ideas about some future research that um, I'm interested in. I got my PhD here at UW, um, here in AOS, um, under John Anderson back in 1997. This work was um, focusing on microbursts, and we used a computer that John designed and built with one of his graduate students we called the Wisconsin Model Engine. And the, um, what we were trying to study was the effects of uh, multiple microbursts on the wind and how essentially uh, aircraft encountering complex microburst interactions might be affected. So here's a, a video that was made on uh, a while ago taken from a VHS tape that has followed me around a bit. You can see the Mekitis logo in the bottom right. That's the way we used to do this. Have to take a VHS down and plug the frames in and record them. And here are two microbursts, uh, the potential temperature field showing you the cold air descending to the ground, uh, colliding and interacting in interesting ways. Uh, some of the work th that I did showed that there were some uh, wind regimes between the two microbursts that were quite hazardous and if that a plane tried to to escape those two by flying through them, it would be bad for them. Um, one of the first projects I did for John was actually to convert his history file format that he had come up with to what Viz5D read. And that sort of, the die was sort of cast, I think, at that point because I've pretty much been doing data conversion, organizing, and managing uh, ever since then. Eventually, we transferred off of the Wisconsin model engine, and which was, you know, hard to pretty hard to use actually, um, and onto a more traditional Beowulf type cluster of Linux machines uh, hooked together by a switch. And then we turned our data format over to NetCDF, which had come out recently, and um, we've gone on from there. Uh, fo coming to the 2000s, I started a faculty position in North Carolina and um, at UNC Asheville and started working with supercells with Robert Wilhelmson. At this point, John had moved on to do other things. Um, I started looking at supercells and using a model called NCommas that was developed at the U of I. NCommas is sort of the descendant of the Clint Wilhelmson model and did some things there. One of the things about NCommas was it was a shared memory model, so it, it could exploit multiple processors on a given shared memory node, but it was unable to do distributed memory uh, calculations that supercomputers uh, require if you're gonna actually utilize them. Right about that time, I was thinking of converting NCommas into a MPI model when I met George Bryan at a Wharf user seminar in Boulder, and George wrote CM1, and CM1 was written from the ground up to take advantage of supercomputers and has uh, MPI and uh, overlapping um, communication, non-blocking I.O. or non-blocking communication. So I started using CM1 and using uh, the TerraGrid and other um, national facilities uh, and statewide facilities, the North Carolina Supercomputing Center as well, which is now defunct. Um, so i started been using CM1 for quite a while in the early 2010s, I was part of a team led by Bob Wilhelmson to access the new Blue Waters machine, which actually was so new it hadn't been built yet. <laughs> and we got access to the machine that was built, and I started to port CM1 and my patches to the, to the model, my I.O. code, to Blue Waters. Um, right about that time, I did my, my sabbatical, my only sabbatical, while I was at CMU, and that was a very fruitful time for me to experiment with different approaches towards I.O. and data management. And that's where I kind of settled on the approach that I ended up calling uh, LOFS, which is uh, a file system uh, comprised of HDF5 files utilizing compression code and, you know, it's, I have sort of an API built around it and some tools. But it's allowed me to save data extremely frequently, uh, temporally, and uh, at the full resolution spatially. I'm, up, I'm able to save data up to every model time step. And when I do that, it only takes about three quarters of the wall clock time. So it, you pay for it up front with some pain, but the result is pretty good because now you can go back and do things that would normally require access to a full supercomputer to do like Lagrangian parcel analysis and such. And uh, some of the work that I'm currently working on with, with, my, with my students uh, involves exploiting that data set. So back in um, 
back in 2014, I finally had the simulation that I needed. I already had the data format stuff worked out, but now I had um, the actual simulation with the EF5 tornado. And that end ended up um, the catalyst that got me coming back to, to UW to do, uh, to do research. And I started at SIMS in SSEC in 2015. So what I've been working on the past couple of years and what I'm currently working on, um, <coughs> The big, the big one is the supercells and the tornadoes. So, you know, the main questions are, what's going on in top-end supercells that is not going on in most other supercells? Um, how do tornadoes form in supercells? So the, the question of tornado genesis, which there's a couple of theories, but um, what we're seeing in our simulation is something that's kind of new. Um, and, you know, what maintains these, the big, long-track EF5-type uh, tornadoes? And, in fact, from my perspective, genesis and maintenance are really all part of the same basic process, um, and that's where our research, uh, the, the, the thrust of it is right now. The, the, I wouldn't have been able to get this done without all this computer code that handles the I.O. and such, um, and, and this is something that I personally feel more scientists should probably pay attention to, and if they don't, they're going to be forced to anyway. Um, I am not a big fan of in situ visualization when you actually need the entire supercomputing the entire supercomputing computer running your model at the same time you're visualizing it for me I need the data because I know I'm going to be spending years analyzing it so I have an approach that's about the polar opposite of in situ um, so I'll be using this this data that we've that we've generated um, through our simulations to analyze in the future so here's an example of something I've done. This is just one of my many volume rendered images of the vorticity field. In this case, it's shaded by the updraft velocity. And you can see that there's, uh, this, this data is displayed every single model time step, one sixth of a second. So that's uh, about, uh, I'm, I'm running it at 10 times real time here to, for the sake of time. Uh, you can see all these uh, ver vortex mergers going on, and you'll see one dominant vortex kind of come out of this, and that's the tornado. The tornado that forms is um, on the virtual ground, you might say, for about an hour and a half, and reaches EF5 strength and becomes a multiple vortex tornado with all sorts of interesting things going on in it. So, you know, this, I have this data, I can regenerate this, I can rotate the box 45 degrees because I, I got the data, all I need is uh, a machine to do the rendering. It takes about 15 minutes uh, to render each individual frame, and so long as you have enough nodes, you can, you can render them concurrently. But this, uh, lately what I've done that I'm pretty excited about is I've, I've done temporal averaging of these fields. So I'm saving data, let's say I save data every one second, I, it, there's a lot of turbulence, you know, basically fully resolved turbulence in here, and I'd like to actually go and look at the steady state type uh, flow patterns. So one thing you can do, because I'm moving the box with the storm, is I can just do temporal averaging. So this field, these fields here have been averaged over two minutes using one second data. So it's a moving window average, so I just go and center, well, you're seeing the time centered on the two minute interval. So I'll animate it. On the left, you see streamwise vorticity at about a half a kilometer above the ground. On the right, you see pressure perturbation from base state. And one thing that's really interesting is you see this rapid pressure drop at this level, and it's actually at the ground level and higher up too, that uh, is not tornado genesis, but it precedes it. This is associated with a feature we've called the SVC, or streamwise vorticity current, which is uh, that big bullseye of streamwise vorticity you see on the left. So you see this surge of, or this big drop in pressure followed shortly by uh, the formation of a tornado, you'll see to the southeast of that feature. So, and, and then that the pressure kind of backs off for a little bit, which is interesting. And then over time, it ramps back up again, and both the SVC uh, induced pressure drop and the tornado pressure drop both uh, sort of intensify, and you see uh, things really take off. So this is another approach. It's another big data type thing where you've got, you know, in order to do these temporal averages, I did them from files, so I had to go read in 121 files to do the first average, and then it was just pushing and popping and, and re-averaging, re but it still took a tremendous amount of I.O. to do these temporal averages. So this data set is, is, is pretty valuable to me, and um, I'm going to be using it as well. I can put side-by-side -side temporally averaged fields next to uh, the live fields, the ones that aren't averaged, and, and look, at, look at different things. But, um, so anyway, to sort of go to where I'd like 
to see in the future, the kind of research I'm interested in. Um, I've got a lot of data on tornadoes near the ground, and you know, I'll be looking at that data for years. But I am interested also in what goes on at the top of the thunderstorm. Um, I'm interested in comparing what the model shows to what we sense remotely. And I am interested in expanding into the stratosphere more. I'd like the top of my model domain to extend, say, to 30 kilometers. I'm currently only going, only going up to 20 kilometers. This should uh, be interesting because we can see how the wave propagation, uh, you know, how the energy is, is, is dissipated with these strong updrafts bashing into the stratosphere. Um, I'm also very interested in, in the water vapor intrusion into the stratosphere. Uh, this can lead to ozone depletion and uh, through the chemistry. And I think there would be a, a pretty nice project would be to um, look at very, at very high resolution, say at say 30 meter isotropic resolution at 20 kilometers in, in that region and see how water vapor, uh, how, it, how it basically gets pushed into the stratosphere. Um, so that's a project I'm interested in. I'm gonna be seeking some computer time to do that work shortly. Uh, I'd like to also, like I said, just compare cloud top data to remotely sensed data using some of the expertise here at, at the center. So, you know, if, if, if anyone's interested in that kind of collaboration, you know, when I come back next week, uh, let's talk. I think um, I'm going to be really focusing on getting the tops of the clouds resolved really well, not using r large amounts of vertical stretching, but hopefully being able to do isotropic 30 meter grids um, at that level. Beyond individual idealized, highly idealized uh, supercell simulations, I'm interested in using models like WARF or MPAS to do modeling work on outbreaks. And part of what is motivating me to do this is, is um, trying to get good base state environments to feed CM1 to do uh, the idealized work. And one way you can do that is by running uh, GF, you know, running off the GFS analysis with WARF and then going in and taking soundings out. I, I'm not probably going to be using these models to do the same kind of work I'm doing with CM1 because I think CM1 is pretty much the, the right tool for the job. But looking at the, you know, the non-horizontal homogeneities and all the things going on in the real atmosphere um, is, is an interest, is also is in, of interest to me. And I believe that ensembles are the, should be used whenever possible, even when doing highly idealized work. Um, I uh, have come to the conclusion that to, to do meaningful science, you need to do at least 10 to 20 simulations of a given event in order to tease out the statistical variabilities and, and say the robustness of the solution. So I'm interested in doing ensembles and, and sort of uh, doing more statistical analysis on, on the large amounts of data uh, that are produced. And basically, if you just wanted to sort of summarize my interest, it's primarily using uh, supercomputers to their full extent. I'm, I'm interested in problems that require supercomputers and uh, you know high I.O. and um, that are conducive to the sort of tools that I've built. So it doesn't have to be thunderstorms. Um, I'm interested in projects that go beyond that as well. But uh, I'll thank you for your time. And if anyone wants to talk to me about this stuff, uh, I'll be around and uh, look forward to talking to you.